following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools, funded in part by the Virginia Satellite Educational Network. Greetings from the MTA studio. I'm Della Kidd, and today's guest is James Howe. James, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. With a little help from Harold the Dog, James Howe has introduced thousands, if not millions, of young readers to the possibility of a vampire bunny, named appropriately enough, Benicula. To the most earnest fans, Benicula is the comic heir to a different literary giant, Count Dracula. Instead of the horror of sucked blood that marks the famous Count Dracula, Benicula, the Monroe family pet, mysteriously but ever humorously drains all vegetables of their natural juice. In addition to the Benicula series, James Howe is the author of over 70 books, including the series of Sebastian Barth Mysteries and Pinky and Rex. James, it's great that you're able to join us and answer our many, many questions. I'll try. <laughs> okay. Well, students from around the country have sent in questions about your books, and almost every student there's a common theme, and it's about ideas. It's a common question that all young writers deal with. When did you come up with the idea of Benicula, and once you had the idea, what was your next step? Well, appropriately enough, you, you mentioned the connection to Dracula, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a little embarrassing to admit that Benicula came from watching too many bad vampire movies on late night television. This is going back 30 years. Mm -hmm. Benicula was written, I wrote Benicula with my late wife, Debbie, uh, in starting in 1977. And we got the idea, as I say, from watching all these, what were meant to be good vampire movies, of course, but they were cheaply made and they were really more funny than they were scary. So I started thinking, well, what would be the worst vampire movie I could make and I came up with this character thinking of a fluffy little bunny rabbit named Count Benicula and I didn't start off with a, uh, a writing about him I just made this little homemade uh, greeting card that's my drawing of Benicula this is why I have illustrators do my books <laughs> and um, but it wasn't until maybe a year or two later mm -hmm. uh, that Debbie and I decided to try our hands at writing a book so I brought in with me to show you the very beginnings of Benicula. Yeah. I, I'm, so, I'm surrounded by my characters here. It's very exciting. But once upon a time, of course, there weren't these characters. There were only ideas. So this is the very beginning. I wrote this with my late mm -hmm. wife, Debbie. And we sat down one night after dinner and took out some note paper here and just began writing. So these are just some notes. Um, see a little coffee stain right. there. Had a couple and after dinner coffee. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, just a little bit of thought about mm -hmm. who the characters might be and... Uh, what might happen in the story and then the next day we began writing and that's what we're looking at here this is um well let's see it says I shall never forget the first time I laid these now tired old eyes on our visitors so there's one sentence that actually never changed but you can see of course there are changes now because this was written in collaboration mm -hmm. which means writing with someone else um, there are different ways to go about doing that but what the way we did it was that we just took turns playing secretary. So you mm -hmm. can see over here, this is Debbie's handwriting. And on this sheet over here, it's my handwriting. Wonderful to see how you collaborated <laughs> with her on, on the beginnings of Benicula. Yeah. Well, we have an email. Let's go ahead and go to that. Okay. This is a question from Zaire, who is a student <laughs> at St. Gregory the Great Elementary School in Brooklyn, New York, who writes, Dear Mr. Howe, why did you choose to tell your story from the point of view of a dog? Well. The simple answer, there are two answers to that actually. One is that I grew up with dogs and cats and various other pets and I always enjoyed imagining what the animals would say if they could talk to each other. What is the internal life of the animals that I don't know about and I would just sort of imagine. Um, the other is that my very favorite book as a child, and I brought in my copy of this book, is Charlotte's Web and I'm, this is, um, this is actually a first edition of Charlotte's Web. The book was published when I was six years old. It was given to me as a Christmas present by one of my brothers. And uh, uh, there are many things I love about this story. But one of the things I particularly loved um, was the way that the, uh, the fern, the girl, um, was a little part of, the, had a little bit of insight into this world of animals. Mm -hmm. 
and I wished I could have that too. So that's wh how it started. And since then, I've come to realize that uh, writing animal characters gives you a lot of leeway to tell stories from both a child and an adult point of view, because animals are kind of both and neither. So it's a lot of fun for me. Well, of course, that, that literary device is, is so integral to Panicula, but also the role of humor uh, and the use of puns in your stories. I mean, um, the celery stalks at midnight, howl a day in. Tell us about why you chose to, to use humor in your stories when they're also mysteries. I, I didn't choose it. it just <laughs> humor just comes natural to me. I grew up naturally to me. I grew up in a um, family where there was a lot of punning, a lot of wordplay. Um, we also always sat down to dinner together, almost always sat down uh, to dinner together as a family. And I have three older brothers, and my dad was a big punster and, and always had heard a joke that day, it seemed. So there's a lot of joking and banter and conversation that went on at the table. And it just, it must just be in our genes, but I can't uh, sit down and write. It, it's harder for me to stay serious than it is to be funny when I'm writing. I probably won't say anything at all funny in this interview, so <laughs> <laughs> don't hold uh, out for it. We'll see. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, here's another question ab okay. about the book's narrator, Harold. And it only shows that young readers, they do pick up on I all kinds of details. So listen to this. Okay. This is from Richard in Leesburg, Virginia. And he writes, Dear Mr. Howe, why does Harold like chocolate if chocolate is bad for dogs? And Richard is from Evergreen, Middle, uh, Evergreen Mill Elementary School. Oh, Richard, Richard, Richard. Yeah. Well, you see, I didn't know that when I started writing these books. I had no idea that chocolate was not good for dogs. And so because I love chocolate and Harold was my alter ego, so to speak. I was telling the story through Harold. There are things about, I, when you're writing as a character other than yourself, particularly if you're writing as an animal, say, or someone who's very different from yourself, the way you get inside that character is to think, how would I feel if I were? How would I feel if I were a dog? And I decided that I would not like to have to eat the same you know, dog food in a bowl on the floor every day, and so that's why Harold likes a little parsley sprinkled on it, little treats. But I also have a big sweet tooth, so I gave that to Harold. It was not until, I would say, about 15 years after the first book was mm -hmm. published and Harold was well established as someone who loved chocolate that I started getting letters occasionally mm -hmm. saying, you know, this is bad for dogs. So uh, all I can say in response to that is that Harold is fiction. Uh, the books are fiction. So in this case, we have a chocolate-loving dog. Dogs also don't talk. They don't write. So... Um, you know that, and I've also heard from people that their dogs have eaten chocolate and they've been fine. So I'm not recommending anybody <laughs> feed chocolate to their dogs. No, but but, uh, but when Harold was born in your story, right. we, it was not well known that chocolate was an issue for dogs. Right. Well, it's time for a brief break. When we return, we'll take more of your questions. But first, a chance to stay on the right track. Don't go away. We have lots more to cover. When writing short stories, keep these ideas in mind. Always brainstorm so you know what your story is about. Make sure your story has great details and characters and make the reader feel like they're really there. These tips will help you stay on the right track. Like books that are like journals by kids, but uh, have detail, lots of detail and very um, realistic things that could happen to regular school kids. I like to read um, fantasy books because like just regular books, they get really boring and just to hear dogs bark, cats meow. I like to hear dogs talk and cats talk. My uh, kind of book to read would be a uh, book that had adventure that create suspension, but don't as scare people so much, but still scare people. I like to read um, books like A to Z Mysteries because they're, they're interesting and they make you like never want to stop reading them. And they like help you solve problems and they're very suspenseful, which makes you think what's going to happen next, like what's going to be going on and where, when, and how. Welcome back. My guest is children's author James Howe. 
James, close to half of your books feature Harold, Chester, Howie, and Vanicula. So what I'd like to do is to play a, a quick little word game. Um, okay. What I'd like to do is to concentrate on adjectives, which of course are describing words that make each of these characters unique. So, I say Harold. Hungry. Chester. Suspicious. Howie. Eager. Vanicula. Silent. How did you determine how you wanted these characters to be portrayed? Mm. Well, um, I guess part of the answer to that is because it comes from having a lot of cats, mm -hmm. having pets and observing cats and dogs and sort of seeing the essence of their nature, maybe. Uh, cats, for example, seem to have, to me, a very busy internal life. Mm -hmm. Uh, active imagination. They always seem to, there's something up all the time. And Chester certainly of. does. That's <laughs> right. So, so then they, that put in mind uh, uh, the, the kind of person who, um, I thought, well, if Chester were a reader, for example, he would probably be the kind of reader who knows a little bit about something and thinks they, think they know everything, because cats mm -hmm. also have a lot of attitude. So that is a little bit of where he came from. Um, but, you know, that's, there's not a clear answer I can give mm -hmm. to that in general because characters for me start off with a little, uh, just a little taste of something, whatever it might be, and then as I write them, the flavor grows and, and changes and, and uh, becomes something greater. So the characters sort of lead the way for me. Well, they absolutely, the, the attributes of each of your characters are very distinct and, you know, they, they, they really make the characters come to life. The stories also that you, you develop with your characters have a, a distinct mood. How do you develop a, a, a mystery without scaring young readers? How do you build that suspense? Mm, well, there's no guarantee because I have had young readers say that Benicula is too scary for them. And I would think a vampire bunny who mm -hmm. sucks the juice out of vegetables, that can't be too scary. But I guess maybe the mood of the piece or whatever, the way Chester Maybe Chester gets under their skin somehow and convinces them there's something really scary going on here. But that is a tricky thing to do. Um, with young readers, you don't want to become too scary. And it's just something that I try to stay conscious of. In, in writing for young readers, whatever I'm writing, let's, let's have this be something they can really enjoy, but not take it too far. Not too scary, not too upsetting, not, you know, whatever it might be. Achieve a balance for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Well, we wanted to find out what fifth graders at Greenbrier East Elementary thought of these characters and the possibility that Benicula is, well, just a misunderstood rabbit. In Celery Stocks at Midnight, I love how Howie the dog calls Chester the cat Pop because Why? he technically, Chester technically couldn't be Howie's dad or grandfather or uncle because. A cat can't be a dog's, yeah. Harold is really smart and he's not really goofy, goofing off like Chester is all the time. Cause all Chester does is like sleep all day and eat. And that's what makes it kind of funny because they make a funny combination because they're always like, cause Harold is always telling him off. Well, Chester is different from Harold because like, Chester is like, well, he uses a common sense, but most of the times he gets it wrong. I think the Nicola could be a vampire because he can get out of things like his cage um, without any help, and he drinks the juices out of vegetables. I would say that um, Nicola isn't a vampire, and um, Chester and Harold just think of that. Well, I think he's a vampire, but there's no way to be certain because vampires, they suck blood out of people and not out of vegetables, so there's no way to really be certain about it. But I'm pretty sure he's a vampire. I think Benicula might be a vampire because in books you can use your imagination like Mr. Howe did, and anything is possible, really. And with me in the studio is James Howe, creator of the Benicula series and so many other titles. Jim, do you mind if we go to another email? Let's do it. All right. This is uh, from Naz at Old Creek Elementary who writes, were you afraid people would laugh at you when you wrote your first book? Well, that's a, that's a, <laughs> a great question yeah. because of course I hoped they would laugh at the book, but I think 
what this question is asking is something a little more about being a writer and being an artist, which is putting yourself out there for other people to see. And uh, yes, of course, I, I still worry about that. I've been writing for years and I've written, you know, many, many books. And with each one, you know, I'm a little nervous, like what are people going to think about this? Uh, of course, so many of my books are funny. I hope they will laugh at them. But as I say, I hope they'll laugh at the book and not at the creator. Well, here's an email from a student in South Carolina um, from an elementary school, Gray Court Owings Elementary School. And uh, Lexi asks, what I would like to ask you is where does your inspiration come from? Oh, Ooh, that's a big question. That's a big, big <laughs> question. That's right. And of course, inspiration comes from so many different places. It can come from your own life, things that really mm -hmm. happen to you, something you overhear in a conversation, something you read in a book. Uh, something that matters deeply to you that you feel you want to write about. Um, so I, the way I like to answer that question is I, I think about collecting ideas more than getting them because ideas really are all around. So I always carry a little notebook with me. Here's my, my little, it's not a very exciting looking little notebook, but that's my little notebook and I have a little pen and I carry these in my pocket. And, um, and that way, um, Wherever I am, I can just jot something down. I have a terrible memory. I do too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I just have to have something that fits in my mm -hmm. pocket. And I was very glad to discover these little pens recently because it's so much uh, easier to fit that in your pocket. And I collect my ideas. I go home. I, I write them up. I have a folder called Writing Ideas. I've had many of those over the years, and I just tuck them away. And if I read something in the newspaper or a magazine or something, I might just cut it out and put it in that folder too. And it really is important to record these things because we think we're going to remember them. And how many times do we Absolutely. get they're gone? Absolutely. They're wonderful ideas. The, the, yeah. the, the, the trickiest thing for me is that a lot, of my, a lot of ideas come to me while I'm driving. You don't want to be writing while you're driving. No, so there are many idea. times I pull over mm -hmm. to the side of the road and I, have, I keep a pad and a pen in the car and I just quickly jot down whatever will help me remember and then I get back on the road again. Um, but that's great. Yeah. Thinking time. All right. Great tip. Well, when we recorded comments about your book, students saw this as an opportunity to talk to you really one on one. Here is a sampling of the many questions posed by the Roadrunner readers of Greenbrier East. Mr. Howe, how do you plan the plot for your stories? Mr. Howe, how do you build suspense to keep people reading? Mr. Howe, how would you think of the idea for Benicula meets Edgar Allan Crow? Mr. Howe, what do you like to do when you're not writing books? Mr. Howe, are any of the characters in your books based on real people? Mr. Howe, is James Howe your real name or is it a publicity name? Interesting set of questions. Why don't we start from back to front? The, fir the last was, is James Howe your real name? Fair question. Is James Howe a nom de plume? I'd love to be able to say nom de plume just for the sake of saying nom de plume, but James Howe's it's my fun real to name. Say. <laughs> yeah. yes. okay. I got it in twice anyway, but yes, James Howe's my real name. All right. Then you were also asked, what do you like to do when you're not writing? Oh, I like to read. That's a big surprise. Mm -hmm. I also love to draw. I take drawing classes. I like to uh, uh, bike. I like to go for walks with my dog and to spend time with my friends and with my daughter. Are any of the characters based on real people? Uh, not so much. The characters uh, are based on uh, either they're just completely imaginary but or they're based in, on parts of mm -hmm. people, little bits and pieces. You know, writers just kind of take from everywhere. So, Writers are always observing around them, that's yes, for sure. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you get the ideas for Benicula meets Edgar Allan Crow? Well, I love crows. I used to live in a house that had many, many crows in the backyard, and I would look at them, at them from my uh, office every day, and I really enjoyed observing them, and I just became very fond of them. I also can't resist a good pun, so I came up with the name Edgar Allan Crow some time back, uh, you know, being a pun on Edgar Allan mm -hmm. Poe, and I just thought, I've got to do something with this name sometime. So it really uh, started from just that, those little places, which is often where books do start from, is just some little piece of something that sparks your interest or you get excited thinking about doing something with it for whatever reason, because you connect somehow. And the first in that series of questions from those students was, how do you plan the plot for your stories? Oh, that's the oh, hardest part yeah. for me. That's the hardest part for me. You know, you've heard beginning, middle, and end. Well, mm -hmm. I think of it as beginning, muddle, and end. Muddle being kind of a mess. 
uh, because the hardest part for me really is I usually have a great idea what's going to happen at the beginning and I often know where the story's going to end up. But coming up with a plot um, is, is more difficult for me. I do not outline, as I said before. So usually what I do is as I'm working forward, I just keep uh, asking myself questions and making notes and say, oh, what if this happened? What if that happened? And begin to get an idea of how I'm connecting from that middle to the end. Almost like the, the uh, technique we use in the classroom, which is mind mapping or webbing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's time for another email. This is from an older set of students from W.R. Thomas Middle School Book Club in Miami, Florida. They read Holiday Inn and the Benicula series, but they really focused on the theme of bullying found in The Misfits. And here's part of the question. We found The Misfits look at the top of har topic of harassment and verbal bullying, a topic we wanted to read about. We enjoyed their approach to the problem and its effect. At any time in the future, do you plan on writing another book focusing on other teenage problems such as alcohol, drugs, or peer pressure? Uh, I don't have any plans to write on those particular uh, topics, but I don't know what the future will bring. Mm -hmm. um, the, the subject of the misfits, which has to do with, with being different um, and being true to yourself, uh, particularly at a time in life when it's very, very hard to do that, when you're getting a lot of pressure to be like other people, mm -hmm. so you belong, so you be popular, and also being um, uh, sort of punished if, you're, if you don't fit in. So you're called names, uh, you, you might even be physically attacked or verbally attacked, mm -hmm. certainly, uh, excluded, all those kinds of things that go on very much in the middle school years. And sometimes in elementary, sometimes in life, mm -hmm. you know, it's exactly. part of life. But I, I wanted to look at a way to, to get kids and get people in schools particularly thinking about, um, you know, why this problem goes on, what can we do about it. And so I took that on in The Misfits. And in, and in writing that book, I was just trying to write a good story and basically present characters who were different in one way or another or were seen as different but who felt good about themselves. But in the course of writing it, they, they decided to um, try to end name calling in their school. Mm -hmm. And the exciting thing is that led to a national movement called National No Name Calling Week that takes place uh, the last week of January every year in many, many, many middle schools and now elementary schools too around the country. So it's very exciting and I wrote another book with the same characters called Totally Joe. Um, there are four main characters, so I still have in my head to mm -hmm. write from the points of view of the other two at some point. Well, they certainly took on the destructiveness of bullying in schools and in our personal lives. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go to another email from McKinley Middle School in West Virginia. I'm not sure if this student read The Misfits or not, but mm -hmm. here's the question. <laughs> Dear Mr. Howe, how do you determine what to write about? And this is from Shane. How do you determine what to write about? Well, I think how you determine it is it sort of goes back to that... Uh, question about the crows in the backyard and a pun and, and you know, name calling and being different, those are issues that really, really matter to me. Um, you determine uh, what you're going to write about and how you're going to write about it based on what you, f you connect with. Mm -hmm. And I teach writing workshops sometimes and this is a, a big, big uh, thing, thrust of what I do with kids is, is how do you find your way to something that matters to you? It doesn't mean it has to be really, really serious but it's got to be something you connect with, that there's a point to you being the person who's going right to write Write about this. what's familiar or what you... Well, not necessarily even about what's familiar, mm -hmm. but what, it, what, what matters to you in some way. You know, it, it could be that, you know, imagining sp space aliens or life on another planet really matters to you. That excites you and mm -hmm. gets you interested, so you could write about that. But there has to be a reason that... The only thing that makes writing different, that makes one book different from another, one story different from another, is the writer. That's the secret ingredient. And that is true for young writers as, as well, that you are, you are what you bring to your writing. You are what makes it unique. That's called voice. Um, and it it's very much comes back to something that you really, really care about and want to write. And that will ring clear. Mm -hmm. Liam writes from Old Creek Elementary, how, does it t how long does it take to write one book? Mm. Mm. <laughs> These are tough questions. Yes, they oh, are. Boy. They're thinking. Yeah, they are. Um, well, that, of course, depends on how much uh, trouble you're having writing a book, how, what the challenges are of writing a particular book. Um, 
not so much the length of the book. I've written picture, the shortest time it ever took me to write a picture book was half an hour. I had an idea, I sat down, I just wrote it. The longest time it took me to write one picture book was probably six or seven months. No, not many, not much difference in terms of number of words, but just to get a book or a story or a piece of writing to be as close to what you have in your head you want to say. And sometimes you're not entirely clear what that is. Sometimes you're just having trouble finding mm -hmm. the best way to tell it. Um, and of course, some books are much more complicated. They may involve research or there may be just many more levels to the story that you need to spend time with. So I don't have one answer for that question. I didn't imagine you would. <laughs> this is an email from Mia, and Mia writes, do you have any tips for getting started writing? My writing is good, but I can't bring myself to get started easily. Mia is from McKinley Middle School. That is a great it's question. It's an excellent question. And I will tell you that, unfortunately, that is not a, a, a question with an easy answer um, because it is something that I find I still experience with every single book I write. I know most writers who I've talked with about this mm -hmm. will say the same thing. Getting yourself started is often very, very difficult. You have this idea in your head. It's a little vague. You're not sure exactly what you want to do. So one of the ways you do it is to just plunge in and start writing, not thinking that what I'm writing now is really it. This is really the first sentence of the book. This is the first chapter. Often I find my first chapter when I'm two or three chapters into a book. Suddenly I'll say, oh, here's where the story should begin. Um, for me, the biggest challenge is finding just the right tone or voice for each story. Um, the Misfits has a very different feeling from Benicula, which oh, has a very different feeling from The Watcher, which is an older young adult novel I wrote, which is very serious. And each of these books has their own way of being told, and it takes time. And I find that once I have that, I, I can then really continue on. But that's the biggest challenge. Well, this is all great tips. Can you leave us with a literary scoop? What are you working on now? Oh, what am Ooh. I working on now? <laughs> well, um, I'm a little superstitious about talking about what I'm working on now. <laughs> uh, and then in, in truth, I've just finished one um, picture book, and I am um, planning on working on something older, probably, again, for the um, middle school uh, readers, uh, readership like The Misfits and Totally Joe. I'm finding that's a, an, an age that I really, really enjoy writing for, and there's a lot that's going on then. So I, I will plan on doing that. I will say I am not planning on doing another Benicula book soon, because I don't want to leave that hanging with people thinking, oh, is he going to write another Benicula yeah. book? Uh, I don't know. I won't say never, because I never say never, but I don't have plans for one in the near future. I have other things I'm going to be trying my hand at. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you. I've enjoyed it, too. For more information about James Howe, visit him at the Simon & Schuster website at www.simonsays.com. For more information about the Fairfax Network, visit us at www.fcps.edu slash Fairfax Network. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Della Kidd. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming.